Hello, everyone. My name is Charlie Rodnewson, and I'm a practice coach with the Academy of Professional Excellence, the San Diego State Research Foundation. I'm so excited to bring to you the Academy i3 podcast. This is a series of podcasts where we lead with open hearts and open minds to inspire, inquire, and impact the workforce. Welcome back, listeners, to the Academy podcast. Um, we are joined with great guests today to really introduce our leadership series that we're going to be um, bringing on for a two-part episode. So to lead us off with introductions, um, I would like to pitch it over to Manola to introduce herself. Thank you. I'm Manola Clark Manson. I have worked at uh, the Academy for 15 years this year. Yay, me. Um, I, uh, I think um, that I have been on leadership for the majority of that time. I would say maybe three years I wasn't on um, the official executive leadership. Um, and prior to that, I have been working in, in a leadership role almost um, practically all of my work life. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Please introduce yourself. Yes. Hi, I'm Jennifer Tucker Tatlow, and I'm the CEO of the Academy for Professional Excellence at San Diego State University School of Social Work. And the Academy provides workforce development solutions to the broader health and human services community in Southern California. And I've been with the Academy, this is going on my 23rd year, and I've been in a leadership position formally since about 2004. Um, and so almost 20 years of my time here. And it's an honor to be with you all today. I'm looking forward to this discussion. Yay. Well, thank you both uh, for just being able to have you all here in community. And I know we'll, we'll get into it a little bit more um, as we talk about our topic today, but I'd love to just hear briefly, you know, what, what do you both feel is is sort of that that impact within your role, like something that you you just we wake up and you enjoy what you do, and that that's sort of the impact that you have in terms of your work. So, whoever would like to respond to that, I'll go because I'll go. Um, I think that what gets me going related to my work is the ability to be creative in community. It is the opportunity to join with other minds and create something that I couldn't possibly ever create on my own. Um, and then watch it grow. Um, and that can come in um, a new something created. It also can be a, a new interaction or a new possibility of interactions. Um, it's, uh, that's what does it, that, that ability to be in community and to expand. Thanks, Manola. Similar to that, my, I get inspired by opportunities to connect. I will say that probably one of my favorite things that invigorates me at the Academy is actually orienting and onboarding our new team members because I get to find out who they are, how they came to be with us, like their backgrounds or experiences that will be contributing to the diversity of our team and our perspectives and our decisions. And so those types of things really energize me as well as opportunities when we're, when we're meeting with our partners to really engage in deep conversations about what the needs are so that we can co-create solutions together. Um, so opportunities to connect and have genuine and deep connections with folks. Yeah, I love that. I, I, I for sure connect with that aspect of the onboarding and the connection piece. I remember even when I started, that was something that I'd never experienced before, or just having that like connection to leadership of like, hey, you know, we get to um, connect with each other on just, you know, what's important for us, not only within the organization, but also just getting to know one another um, on a personal level as well. So I think that really sets us up as a worker standpoint, like really confidently to go into the work. So thank you uh, both for, for sharing your impact points. And I know we're, we're gonna get into some deeper conversations on just how do we look in terms of leadership in, in this case, culturally responsive leadership and how do we define that uh, for our listeners? So 
Uh, Manola, if you'd like to start, you know, what is and, and how would you define culturally responsive leadership? So um, what is a shame for me is that there has to be a definition for leadership and culturally responsive leadership. Because for me, their good leadership is culturally responsive leadership. It doesn't require more things than good leadership or it should. And I all I know about shoulds. However, if you create a space for people to be able to grow, then you've created a place that's going to be much more efficient, um, going to meet your milestones, your goals, your financial responsibilities. Um, people want to join your organization. Um, People want to, surprisingly, if your organization is happy, secure, and functioning well, people want to buy your services, whatever those services are. Um, and you begin to have a reputation in the world that encourages people to look towards you. All those things are things that a good leader wants and needs to be able to lead well. Um, if you want loyalty, if you present an environment where it is safe and comfortable to be loyal, you're gonna get loyal people. If you're looking for an environment that creates uh, innovation, um, uh, consistency in, in, in work performance, high work performance, all of those things happen when you're in an environment where you are safe in being who you are. And if you just think for a second about, um, about that whole thing about safety, and let's talk about it in a different, a different way. If I, as a, we're gonna use math. If I, as a human have to spend expend 25 to 35% of my mind power on what I need to do to act and behave properly, whatever the properly is in your organization, that's a significant amount of brain power that you no longer have access to. And that also makes me takes a significant amount of my time and energy away from work. So I'm not as productive as the next person. So if I want, again, all those things as a, a good leader is looking as the checkpoints of me being a good leader, um, demonstrating that I am a good leader, then you have to be culturally responsive because being culturally responsive allows for those things to happen. And tying into that, the environment of safety, creating that environment of true belonging, inclusivity and safety is, is critical. And, and I think cultural responsive leadership, culturally responsive leadership is an approach to leadership where leaders engage in some very specific practices that are aimed at bringing about that culture of belonging, safety, and acceptance. And that's an environment where folks can bring their full expression of themselves to work and not feel like they have to leave any of those aspects at the door um, or at the Zoom entrance, because we need to be able to have those fully expressed if we're gonna benefit from the diversity of perspectives and contributions of our team. And so some of the things I'm looking for when I think about what cultural responsive leadership looks like to me is leaders who truly listen and leverage the different perspectives and experiences that are being brought forward by their staff. In order to do that, we have to sit in a place of humility and be able to listen and be curious and ask and create space for those perspectives to be shared and then truly use what we hear to, to do things different and to make decisions accordingly. So I think that listening and leveraging the differences is important. I also think a culturally responsive leader really needs to be committed to demonstrating a commitment to self-awareness and to ongoing growth and development. 
because if you don't have an ability to really reflect upon how your interactions, actions, and behaviors impact those around you and how they show up, then you're doing a disservice to the organization. So that's a critical component of cultural responsive leadership from my perspective. I also think cultural responsive leaders need to be able to use power and privilege in ways to address inequities because if we can let power and privilege go unchecked, it can inadvertently, inadvertently and or intentionally even lead to the disadvantaging of people who have historically been targeted for marginalization and that's not okay. We have to be actively working against that by using power and privilege appropriately to do that. And, and the last component I think I'd like to kind of elevate at this point is just cultural responsive leadership needs to be willing to acknowledge the steps when they occur, acknowledge when harm has occurred do the work needed to make repairs, to take accountability for actions that have created harm, and then work on beginning to start that reconciliation process so that that relationship can repair and even deepen to enhance the way that folks work together. So those are the key components from my perspective. I think I'd, I'd like to emphasize something you said, Jen. You said um, repair. I, I, I think we have both in our society and when we talk about management training or leadership training, we, we talk about acknowledging mistakes, but we often don't talk about the next step. And that is the repairing. Um, I apologized, isn't that enough? Um, I acknowledge that I did something wrong, isn't that enough? And um, a good leader goes beyond that um, and says, what can I do to rectify, to repair? Otherwise there's long-term harm and you've, you've just set yourself up for an extended, um, uh, extended problem as opposed to um, eliminated or shortened um, a problem. Yeah, and I think, you know, in, in really reflecting on what you both said, I think there's two key parts that I wanted to emphasize as well, which was cultural responsiveness. I think, you know, over time, um, sort of how we approach, you know, engaging with our workforce and, and leading our workforce, there, there used to be sort of cultural sensitivity, which was what it was. And then now there's cultural responsiveness, where it has sort of more of that proactive you know, um, leading forward type of connotation with it, where there's so much more action that goes with that. And I think that ties in with what you said, Manola, which is being able to have what's next and how do we sort of be involved in that? And as opposed to just sort of acknowledging, but how do we take the steps to be able to support and collaborate with others? Um, Cause I think a lot of that can also parallel to those we serve as well. Cause if we're modeling it within the, the, our organization, it can then transpire outwards to those who we serve. Right. right. I think it's a good point to um, talk about cultural responsiveness for just a second more, because um, we, we, the three of us, use that very easily and comfortably, but I don't know that, um, that it has, I, I think it's still a recent term. And um, one of uh, the differences between being culturally responsive and culturally sensitive or culturally aware um, um, has made people a little anxious about this whole cultural thing. Because if I'm culturally sensitive, then I have to understand everybody everywhere all the time. And I, I, I can't possibly, have the time enough to read enough, to see enough, to experience enough, to be culturally aware and or sensitive to everybody. However, if I'm culturally responsive, I can be culturally responsive to anybody. If I understand about humility and, and assuming I don't know, as opposed to assuming I do, um, about and um, asking questions. Um, 
so that I can be more responsive to an individual than assuming and being totally aware of everything and anything. So it gives me permission to be a human being um, as opposed to uh, a computer that has all the information ever was on any cultural group there is. Yeah, it's a, a human being on, on an ongoing learning journey. And there is no end point, which you can sometimes you hear cultural competence, like, oh, I did it. I checked that off. I'm done. No, it, it's an ongoing learning process. And by having that learning process and leaning into inquiry, we can be flexible, adaptive, and tailor the way we're interacting based on what's the situation that's unfolding in front of us. And it makes me think of, you know, we used to say, treat others as you want to be treated. And now we say, no, treat others as they want to be treated. And in order to know that, you have to be insightful as to what their needs are and, and listening to what their ask is. Great points, yeah. And so I, I think, yeah, that built a great bridge for us to, to look into our, our next point that we want to cover, which is, you know, why is culturally responsive leadership important to the organization, for the staff, and for those we serve? Because I know you all have sort of brought up you know some um, key areas already but can we expand a little bit more on those three points of organization staff and those we serve so please i can go first um, some of the things that come to mind as i think about the benefits that we see within the academy as we work to cultivate a culture responsive culture and organization we see increased innovation and creativity because you can't have that if you don't have staff feeling comfortable speaking up and sharing their perspectives, regardless of position in the organization, regardless of background and experience, regardless of life experience, the innovation and creativity can only happen when you have that space of um, ongoing sharing and learning. I also think a benefit is enhanced connection and relationships. And you can't really get to authentic connection and relationships if you're staying at a surface level. So you have to be using these practices to, to engage more deeply with one another because then you can have connections that are more authentic and that can lead to enhanced problem solving, decision making, ultimately better decisions about the services we're providing because the connection is there to, and the relationships exist to engage in those discussions. Um, and by doing that, you get employees who feel more engaged, more willing and, and, and committed to be with the organization for the long term. And we also end up with um, an, an increase, by doing cultural responsive leadership, we have an increased ability for folks to identify ways their own behavior or the behavior of others might be impacting those feelings of safety and connection and ways and skills and tools to, to address that and, and create that space. And ultimately, our mission can be delivered more effectively if staff are engaging in some of these ways I've just discussed. I think that um, what you said, Jen, really feeds into my idea about the organization. For me, what it does is it it ensures that leadership doesn't live only in the CEO. And that may initially sound like, what, what, what? <laughs> it's supposed to be there. But if, if you're gonna run a good organization, then leadership should be everywhere. Everybody should be able to pick up the baton and move it forward. It shouldn't require the CEO to come down and say, pick up the baton so we can move it forward. Um, so if, if the space is, again, that place where, um, where everybody can provide input, where everybody is understood, everybody has a way of being included, then, then the organization is is a being in itself not dependent on one person, one manager, one executive leader? Yes, and uh, kind of jumping ahead a little bit to the piece about our journey, as a CEO, that's, that's 
required an intentional shift for me. So the expectations as a CEO is you come in and you have the answers and you you speak first and you bring the expertise and all of the things, especially like as a woman CEO, you're even more, I think, personally feeling more pressured to get it right, to be the solid and steady, stable, all-knowing being. That's not realistic. It's not possible. I'm not a superhuman. I'm, I'm going to stop trying to be that. And so by shifting the way I show up and even where I show up, how I show up, to make sure that I'm not speaking first, that I'm letting others weigh in, that I'm bringing inquiry and questions to the conversation versus my ideas and leading with those. That's been essential to create space for others to truly engage in the discussions in a way that we can get to shared leadership. And so it's, it's an intentional shift that a CEO or any leader in an organization has to be conscientious of and work in, in a meeting by meeting basis to implement. Right. Because if you don't, what ends up happening is um, Jen hired me because I was qualified, right? You hire people as, as leaders because they are qualified. And then if you follow that with never giving me an opportunity to share those qualifications, because the answers are already there, because the, the new ideas are already there, wh why have you hired me? You have wasted me. Absolutely. Oh, no, I mean, really, really powerful um, aspects that you are bringing up, especially it's, it starts to really honor each individual worker, each individual leader for what they authentically bring in to the organization. Because each person, like you said, is hired for whatever their strengths are, whatever they, they bring into that role. And how do we find more ways to, to honor that, to leverage that, to be able to infuse that? within the fabric of the organization to where like the organization inherently transforms moving forward. It isn't just sort of, this is how we follow things. These are the process and procedures, but these are the qualities that are the individuals that we bring in. And that's influencing just sort of the, the shift in the organization as well, moving mm -hmm. forward. And it's not even just bringing folks in based on the skills and qualities and experiences they have, but on the potential that they have to, to contribute. And so having to be conscientious of allowing those opportunities for the potential to evolve and be contributed. It also, you know, Jen just said, you know, it takes a conscientious effort on the leader. Um, I, I, I think it's important to acknowledge that it takes a conscientious effort on creating the space and encouraging the staff to make those changes too. Because we all grew up in the same country. We all know what the rules are. The CEO's at the top and you're somewhere below. And the CEO's supposed to know everything and supposed to direct us and we're supposed to follow. So when you turn around and say, okay, what do you wanna do? You will get a surprise from many people saying, uh, um, uh, you're supposed to tell me that. So it takes an additional effort on your part to say, I'm not going to. So what do you want to do? Yeah, I had a, an aha moment around that. Uh, recently, I was one of my teams was going to get together for a strategic planning session and I had said I'd join in the discussion and so I came in showed up in the zoom room we were doing our starting off we start off with emotional bandwidth to see how folks are doing and if they're ready to engage and how they're how they're able to show up and one of the staff had said well my anxiety level is really high because Jen TT is here and I'm like wait it's it's me it's Jen TT like I I, I, I don't feel I'm a leader that leads with ego and like all this positioning. And yet I cannot remove myself from the title I bring, regardless of how I fe feel like I'm showing up and interacting. So I keep that in my pocket when I show up for future meetings now, or if I even choose to show up at all. That's that, that sort of self-reflection piece that, that you talked about earlier is being able to recognize that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And, and I know, Jen, you, you brought up a great uh, sort of transitional teaser for us about, you know, the journey. And I'd love to get into that a little bit more, which is, you know, what does that journey look like and sharing with our listeners sort of the, the context, the foundation for what those listeners can expect in our next episode to follow this series. Um, so maybe like what were your goals, some key successes some misses or takeaways that maybe we can set the, the stage for us leading mm -hmm. into our next episode. Yeah, I can I can share some takeaways. So historically, you know, since I've been with the academy 23 years almost, and we have been leaning into inclusivity since I got here. But we really recognize with with the murder of George Floyd and the witnessing of the impact that that and the murders of other Black, Indigenous, and persons of color was having on our team, we saw that we needed to do things differently and evolve further. And so we we had to make some shifts. We would you know, we would rely on quantitative data. We do employee engagement surveys and equity climate assessments. Uh, what are the themes? What are the trends? One of the key shifts I think that we're making is around using qualitative data, stories, experiences to guide our work so we can share more in the upcoming message. I mean, meeting about some of the feedback that we've heard and how we've really engaged in those discussions to inform what do we really need to do differently? How do we act differently? How do we learn differently? How do we be to differently together? So that's one of the key takeaways that I start with and I'll invite Manola to, to add in. I think um, today I'm, I'm stuck on, um, on uh, repair. So I think, I think we started in a way of, okay, we're doing something, we're gonna do some cultural competence work and we could give a class. We could give the whole academy some classes and, and that will be enough. And we were naive in thinking that that would be enough or that that would work. I mean, I, I know, a no, I'm, I'm confident that a number of listeners have been in trainings over the last years um, where the organization said, okay, we need to work on cultural competence. So here, here, here it is, here's this four hour training, here's this one hour training, here's this 15 minute e-learning to, to review and, and nothing really happening. Or if something happened, um, it was not helpful. So you got a bunch of staff mad as opposed to getting some understanding. Um, I can remember a couple of times where our intentions, and forget about intentions and impact, mm -hmm. but our intentions, <laughs> were really positive and we knew that this one thing that we did was going to change everybody's thinking. I, I don't think we would make that mistake again. Um, I think we have grown and matured both as a, as a industry, um, but also as individuals in this organization. And I think how we made mistakes and how we cleaned up um, and how we got up and moved forward and pressed on something that for a lot of people was really difficult. Um, um, I think those are, are terribly interesting things to talk about. And um, I look forward for an opportunity to, to share that with you. To add on to that, I will say thanks for bringing that up. That was a very humbling experience because we are a workforce development training organization, and we know that to create changes in practice, you have to cultivate changes in the heart and before you, you know, you get to the intellectual level. And we're like, how did that just happen? Like, we know that you need to engage folks in why this is important, and and not only do the training, but have things leading, setting the stage for that, and then also have the ability to do follow-up work to make sure folks know how to integrate it into the day-to-day -day practice and how to, how to an environment where you're going to be expected to step in, you're going to be expected to mess up and it's going to be safe to do so. And then coached and all of us making mistakes, getting back up again and engaging once again, instead of a one and done training. So absolutely. That was 
a key lesson that we learned the hard way, I would say. Yeah, I, I think putting, putting it all together in terms of like, what really stood out to what you said is it's not just sort of what, what we learn and, and how that impacts what we think, what we know of the knowledge of it, but it's really how, how do we sort of impact the heart, the spirit, the soul of just, okay, the, these are some, some things that it's going to impact each person differently. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, there's no magical, you know, training that's going to, to solve mm -hmm. that for each person. It's, it's going to be a, a, each person's unique journey, unique experiences. And, and how do we sort of honor and uplift that and, and have that be part of our work as well? And, and how do we honor that folks are coming in in different parts of what we call like that spectrum of learning? There's going to be folks that are really just getting started and not comfortable being uncomfortable. And then there are going to be folks that have been doing this for a while. And so you have to be willing to uh, work with folks where they are. And as long as everybody is moving together in the right direction, not expecting everybody's going to go from, you know, zero to 60 in, in five seconds. Um, what else can can we um, sort of, in a way, tease in, in preparation for our next episode of just sort of the journey or, or other areas you want to highlight sort of generally as a foundation for us? Are you, I think I, 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 I go, go. <laughs> I don't want to cut you off. Um, I think what we heard, and I want to be able to share more about in our next episode, is we heard some pretty concrete expectations from our staff as to how leadership team need to show up differently around modeling vulnerability about spaces um, out of our heads into our hearts, willing to listen with our bodies, not with our, our intellect. And so some of those kind of direct expectations resulted in our commitment to, to do some work differently. And that I think informs some of the strategies we've put in place that we can talk more about in our next episode. One of the things that I look forward to the opportunity to talk more about when we come together again is about some of this explicit expectation that we heard from our staff about how leadership shows up. And we heard things like leadership team needs to get comfortable engaging in uncomfortable conversations. Leadership team needs to get out of their heads and into our hearts. Listening with our bodies instead of with our intellect. Um, acknowledging the emotions, feeling the emotions and acknowledging that those emotions are having an impact on how we're reacting and responding. So we, I think uh, leadership has done a lot of work with one another in our small group and then with our, with our teams to implement some of those practices based on the requests we receive from our team and we can share more about kind of how that has played out when we come together again. And how we have created space so the teams, so people can say something to us about how we're showing up and mm -hmm. feeling comfortable. Okay, little quotes on that. Um, <laughs> being Feeling comfortable hearing from and being available to hear from the staff about what it is they're wanting from us. Mm -hmm. Creating a space where folks feel they can call one another in, call leadership in when there's a learning opportunity or where there's been an impact that needs to be acknowledged. Yeah, I, I think it, it definitely gives a, a strong sense leading up to our next episode of just, how do we cultivate, um, and this was through like actually a TED talk I, I remember hearing about, which is like cultivate these learning zones. The fact that learning is going to be an ongoing process no matter what. And that's just sort of mm -hmm. the, the core aspect of our work, of our organization, and that there really isn't a timeline for that. There's going to be times where there are going to be natural missteps or, you know, us trying to, to understand one another a little bit more. And that's just naturally part of the process. Great. So then I know definitely what listeners can look forward to for our next episode is a little bit more about maybe the strategies that you all have tried on that 
has worked or how do, how do you evolve from those strategies? Um, also, how do you sort of incorporate that sort of organizational health framework into your work? Um, as well as, you know, what do you find to be important for you when you reach some of these obstacles or challenges and, and how did you work through that? So definitely um, a great conversation for our listeners uh, in our next episode. Okay. Thank so you. any any final Thank takeaways you. or any other uh, errors we want to sort of provide for our listeners to finish off this episode? I just appreciate the opportunity to be in, in this space with you both and to be able to sh share some of this learning with, with our broader audience. Mm. This Thank is you. an exciting space to be in. Yeah. And scary. <laughs> <laughs> just saying. <laughs> Okay, uh, I know our listeners will have a, a great episode upcoming and um, I hope they get a chance to listen to this one in preparation for the next one. So until then, uh, we'll, we'll see you all soon in our, for our next episode of the Academy Podcast and then we will be back. <laughs>